Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us uh, for this Flinders University Meet the Minds lecture on the same team, bringing parents, coaches and young athletes together. I'm Chantelle Crossman from Flinders and I'm excited to host today's event as we explore repositioning youth sport to the forefront of best practice. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting this forum on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people and that we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and convey our deep appreciation to the elders of all nations upon which Flinders operates. This event is delivered as part of our Meet the Minds lunchtime lecture series, where you'll meet some of Flinders University's most engaging minds as they bring to you their latest research from a diverse range of fields. Today, we're fortunate to be hearing from Dr. Sam Elliott, who is a senior lecturer in sport, health and physical activity here at Flinders University. Sam is a multi award winning researcher and senior lecturer and all round accomplished author of 36 peer reviewed publications which surround parental um, involvement in youth sport. Sam is a highly sought after thought leader and has presented his work in Australia and internationally in China, the UK, Canada and the US. He has attained over $500,000 of external income as chief investigator and is currently leading an Australian first investigation into how sporting club environments set up parents for successful sporting season. Sam has received a number of prestigious awards, including the Vice Chancellor's Award for Early Career Research, the World Congress on Science and Football, Best, Best Research Paper by Code AFL Award. As always, we're keen to have this uh, be an interactive event with a live Q&A. It's your chance to participate in the discussion and pose questions to the speakers in real time. We do ask, however, that everyone treats this forum respectfully, um, where people are treated with dignity and where differing views are tolerated. We're ready to start receiving questions now via, via the message function on this platform. Um, and so it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sam Elliott. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chantelle, and uh, thank you to Flinders for the opportunity to participate in the Meet the Minds virtual lecture series. It is, of course, Are You OK Day? So I hope that everyone's having a fantastic day um, in the sunshine. And if not, um, if you haven't had a chance to get outside, make sure when you do see someone um, that you do ask them, are you OK? My goal today is to share some research informed ideas um, that hopefully inspire clubs to consider their role in bringing parents, coaches, young athletes closer together. By way of background, we know that sport participation is a political and strategic priority, not just globally uh, or nationally, but certainly here in South Australia. So while participation alone is not only the answer to increasing physical activity in our society, it does remain a popular vehicle for physical activity accumulation, particularly among young children. Hence, sport participation is of high social, cultural, political, as well as economic value. For instance, we know from the research that youth sport participation, if sustained, is associated with at least 38 psychosocial health related benefits. Things like um, lower, uh, sorry, um, high levels of self-esteem, um, lowering of anxiety, improved mood, even improved uh, well-being. We also know that sport participation is a prominent setting for developing what we term in the literature as the five C's, positive youth development, competence, confidence, character, connection and care. And finally, promoting sport participation is clearly an economic uh, of, of economic value to our society um, and health economists estimate certainly in South Australia alone a savings of $804 million in public health expenditure. So our ambition is clear. We want to engage young people in sport or certainly in the physical culture of our society of which sport is a prominent vehicle. However, the promotion of sport participation and more to the point retention of young people in sport remains an elusive challenge. And one of the reasons why that is the case is because we often underestimate the complexity of youth sport as a social experience. Thanks to one of my colleagues in the United States, Travis Dorsch at Utah State um, and some of his co-authors, we now have this wonderful heuristic which I'm presenting here today, which highlights the complexity of youth sport as a social experience. And this particular model identifies a number of really important things, such as the age of the participant involved in youth sport, which can influence a range of subsystems, the family subsystem between parents, sibling, 
and the athlete, as well as the team subsystem between the athlete, their peers, and even the coach. And all of this is captured in a more contextualized environment where the organizational um, demands, their objectives, their standards, as well as the surrounding communities in which we're co-located, all shape experience. However, despite the complexity of youth sport, we often tend to think about, we being everyday consumers of local sport, we tend to think about youth sport in very simplistic, a-theoretical ways. And as a result, we often assume that parents, coaches, and even athletes simply know how to behave, how to communicate properly, how to navigate challenges. In other words, we tend to leave this all to chance. And one of the consequences of that, and we've seen this time and time again, is that there is the potential in this youth sport environment for the development of what we might consider conflictual relationships. So my goal today is really simple. I wanna try and discuss some considerations for clubs, but also for parents, uh, coaches, as well as athletes, on how we can actually bring our most intimately involved stakeholders closer together. In other words, how do we enhance these relationships? So one of the first relationships I want to talk about is the parent-athlete relationship. Um, and certainly uh, my research journey has, has helped me to realise that one of the most important things parents can do to enhance their, their relationship with their child in sport is by adapting and not reducing their involvement across the journey. We often see parents reduce or step back from sport as children intensify their involvement, they, they become a lot older and um, more independent. But my research and that of others in this space would indicate that the key to really enhancing this relationship is to adapt, but it is easier said than done. And I'll give you some examples. So one example, parents often struggle to adapt their involvement when it relates to the provision of feedback. And so you can see this often in the post game context. And often when parents have the same approach, the, the one size fits all, 100% honesty approach to these post game discussions, they can often heighten anxiety and even negative distress with young children. Um, and so although parents try different techniques such as sandwiching their feedback, parents can actually optimise if they feel compelled to provide feedback, they can actually optimise their involvement by maybe considering the context in which they're situated to temper maybe the timing or more to the point, maybe the frequency of these interactions, if they feel compelled to say something at all. Maybe your child, if you're a parent, is in a, uh, in a talent pathway, okay, a talent development program. Um, what the research also tells us is that parents can actually enhance the quality of their involvement by adapting their social and emotional support. And so some research that I conducted a couple of years ago found that in these talent identified environments, the meaning of fun changes when children transition into a talent development program. We also learned that children find it really difficult to then satisfy and fully commit to their dual commitments of school and sport. And the other key finding is that as um, children move into these pathways, the idea of selection or promotion uh, or even deselection will alter children's expectations of individual and collective success. And so you can see just in this one uh, example, the importance of really high levels of parental responsiveness and ad I guess adaption when it comes to their emotional support. In other words, we want to try and help parents tailor the kind of encouragement, advice and informational support that they provide young children. Um, and so this, as I've dubbed on this slide, is really a, a call for parents to consider how they can lean out, lean in, I should say, as well as lean out of different conversations. The other way in which parents can optimise their relationship with children is by customising their social support. And I draw on a recent example of a paper that I um, published um, and some research conducted a couple of years ago, which looked at parents, girls and Australian football. And this indicated that parents really essentially play a vital role in assisting young girls to interpret their competitive experiences, which we found to be key to not only sampling sport, but for girls to return the following year. And so one of the key messages here is uh, really to 
to not underestimate the role of parents in normalising sporting choices, but behind them, the attitudes and the behaviours that lead to those sporting choices. Uh, and this is important because the way in which girls and young children especially perceive their involvement and make sense of their involvement is really a way that um, helps them um, develop a level of self-competence uh, and confidence for the sports that they are involved in. So certainly social support is an example where parents can seek to adapt their involvement. Another relationship in this particular environment is the coach athlete relationship. And as it relates to this particular type of relationship, what I've discovered or learnt a lot about in the last uh, seven, seven, eight, nine years of research is that coaches can benefit from a more contemporaneous uh, and a reflexive approach to their practice. Coaches generally do a wonderful job, no question, especially our volunteer coaches who often are thrown into the role at the last minute. But regardless whether you're a seasoned, experienced coach or a first timer, I think it's really important that we continually ask ourselves questions about how we can expand, extend, and even enhance the quality of our relationships with young athletes. So the first example I want to draw on is um, a recent study that I was a chief investigator on, which looked at the promotion of wider sporting opportunities and what that might mean for young uh, girls and young women um, in South Australia. And one of the considerations that we've learned about is that we need to find new ways to cater and support and, and work with code hoppers or cross coders or those that want to sample different sports in a, in a very sort of contemporaneous sort of society. So what does that mean? Well, firstly, uh, we need to understand that there's a generation of young people that have cultivated a new desire to physically express themselves through sport. Uh, and so one of the things that um, really matters is that if people choose to even temporarily sample other sports, it's really important that the native sport, the first sport of choice, creates quality social connections because we've actually found that that is going to be the key to keeping the door open for a potential return, maybe the following season or later down the track, to their native sports or their first sporting choices. So this is really key. It, it, it emphasises the quality of those social connections that they matter. Coaches can also enhance the quality of their relationships with athletes by reflecting on what more can be done to maximise the proposition of fun and enjoyment. And so I pose this question, are we there yet? This is not a conversation about coaches doing badly. It's actually the opposite. It's saying in addition to the great things we're doing well, what about the other untapped potential of maximising sport enjoyment for young people. And some research uh, one of my PhD students conducted during her honours year uh, actually found in this particular space that clubs do not actively or deliberately use strategies to maximise fun and enjoyment. Um, and we actually found that quite interesting because there are 81 specific fun determinants that have been identified in the literature. And so I think it's a really uh, big uh, question not just for our coaches but for all involved in sport to continually reflect on what more can we do. Um, really, really key. And I guess a final consideration from proving that coach athlete relationship is actually for those parents who fulfill a dual role as parent as well as coach. So when you're wearing two hats, my research has actually found that parents can display differential forms of behavior or treat their child differently in relation to, uh, or, sorry, in comparison to other children, for example, in team sport. And often the reason for this is because parents are concerned by how their actions and their competence as a coach um, is going to be judged by those around them. And so inadvertently what happens is that many coaches, parents in these roles, um, permit the types of behaviours that we actually don't want to see in grassroots sport. Criticism, limited opportunities, limited recognition. And so one of the challenges here is for coaches, even parents in this role, is to really be assisted, to, be, um, to, to have the assistance and the support to establish expectations and boundaries, not just with their own children and with the team uh, participants, participants, but with the surrounding uh, stakeholders as well. The final relationship that I want to talk about today is probably the most difficult one, the parent coach relationship. Um, but we know that this can actually be enhanced by understanding the complex stresses and challenges along the way. However, this rarely occurs because parents and coaches are seldom rarely on the same page. Uh, so it's really a call to adapt a more empathetic approach. 
Some research from one of my colleagues and mentors over in the UK, Camilla Knight, she's a, a, a fantastic leader in this space. Um, some of her earlier work, I think, really helped set the scene for this conversation. Um, and in this particular study, we learned a lot about how coaches view parents. Uh, and the first, I think, thing that we take from this research is that coaches can tend to view parents as a source of stress. Um, parents can be perceived to lack a lot of sports specific understanding. They are perceived to lack respect for the coaches, to be highly demanding of time and attention, and to harbor very parsimonious, if you like, focus on their child rather than the team um, and the, the ambitions of team development. Um, and so one of the consequences of that is that coaches tend to see parents as those who overemphasize winning that very critical uh, and tend to set unrealistic expectations. Um, and one of the challenges, therefore, is that you can see uh, elements of aggressive, defensive and even interrogative behavior, which can increase stress and anxiety. And so one of the, I guess, the, the end points for this is that you, you find coaches not only wanting to minimize contact with parents, but sometimes avoid parents altogether. Together. On the flip side, uh, another really interesting paper from Camilla's earlier work looked at how uh, parents might actually perceive coaches. And what we actually learn is that um, in this very complex relationship, parents can tend to view coaches as unprofessional, to be uh, unfair and certainly to demonstrate poor communication skills. Um, and this can be a source of stress and anxiety for parents, especially if they perceive that they're getting insufficient feedback, there's low interest in their child's development, or if there's a low display of appreciation for the work and the effort that parents put in to enable sport. Um, so you can see here how two worlds are colliding. And I think one of the key things here is that this can only fuel for a lot of young families and a lot of parents and coaches frustration and even confusion. So where does that leave us? Well, one of my PhD students during her honours year, Kaylee, um, and she's on the verge of publishing this really exciting research, sought to answer this question, how do we enhance parent and coach relationships? Uh, and this particular study found a number of really interesting things for consideration. The first one is how do we create opportunities for parents and coaches to share goals, to share values and share expectations? That can't happen on day one when children sign up and register. There needs to be some kind of sequential opportunity across the season. I think clubs can also do some um, uh, will play a, a more pivotal role in creating visibility and shining the light on a lot of the coaches uh, or the parent coaches in those roles uh, of their informal credentialing as much as their formal credentialing. You may not have an ex-AFL player coaching the under 10s, but you might have a mum or dad that's a really fantastic physical, physical education teacher, just as one example, and um, maybe able to bring certain skills to the role. And, and that's really one way of actually um, giving them some confidence um, and some visibility on the things that they bring to the role. We could also maybe tinker with some of these markers of communication. So we could use an intermediary. We could look at some informal opportunities for discussion or maybe think about the methods and even the timing of these types of communications between parents and coaches. And the other consideration is to manage these relational boundaries. And so there's a lot to consider there. And it's not just for parents and coaches, but the surrounding club environment to play a role in that regard. Now, in the pursuit of enhancing the social dimensions of youth sport in all these relationships, of course, the question might be, well, what about Sam right now in 2020 in September, COVID environment? Um, tell us a little bit about that. And so some research that I led um, earlier this year um, basically helped us to, to learn a little bit more about what this might mean in terms of building relationships and bringing these stakeholders closer together. We found that sport, clubs and all the main stakeholders have a social and cultural responsibility, not just for member wellbeing, but to re-engage the disengage. And if we do these things, we actually have the, the if you like, the, the architecture to actually quickly rebuild the volunteer workforce. Um, and that's so necessary for community level sport, especially youth sport. Um, but the other thing that we've learned is that during this COVID pandemic, we need to try and avoid um, simplistic solutions to really complex problems. And I think that's one of the main challenges, but one of the main learnings that I think for sport in South Australia and beyond, that we really need to avoid yearning for simplicity. We need to embrace the complex nature of our sport and really dig deep into some, um, some research driven ideas to, to develop some solutions and a way forward. I'm probably close to being out of time here. So where to next from here? Um, very quickly, 
Um, I'm leading a project right now that's funded or co-funded by the Office for Recreation, Sport and Racing and Flinders University. And I'm asking one question, how do sporting clubs set up parents, set up children for a successful sporting season? Sub questions that sit underneath that, how do coaches perceive their interactions with parents across a season? And more to the point, how do parents perceive their interactions with coaches? We don't want this to be a conversation where parents or coaches have to do all the heavy lifting. We believe that there is uh, a joint responsibility in this type of conversation. And then a third and final question of this research is how might team sports and individual sports engage parents and families from day one? Really exciting. I'm looking forward to some questions. Chantel, I'll pass it back over to you and um, let you facilitate the Q&A. Thanks, Sam. Um, as a parent of, oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. As a parent of, um, to young kids, this is certainly ringing true to me. They're just entering into their sporting years and um, certainly got me thinking about um, my interaction with the kids now and um, and the coaches. Um, we are getting a few questions from the audience, but um, I'll just um, start the discussion. Um, what role do you think schools have um, to actually um, play in fostering the relationships between parents and coaches um, where youth sport is school-based? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question because often in a lot of my research we've probably not focused a lot on school environments and more to the point school sport of which many young children play saturday morning and so forth so um they would be part of this environment and if i go back to travis dorsch's youth sports system it's a really interesting um model that he developed i think when you look at the communities and even the organizations in which we find ourselves located the the opportunities for access, the policies, the resources, um, the the culture of community sport as distinct from school sport, it's still captured in this model. And so it would be incumbent on teachers, of course, school leaders um, to uh, I guess participate in this conversation about how we um, enhance and optimize those conversations, that communication with parents and coaches as much as with children. Yeah, right. And uh, we, we've got a question from Joseph, um, which is talking more about the, the club, um, you know, the, the issues with the club. So um, Joseph has said, as a current committee member in a local basketball club, 100% agree and can confirm that clubs do not use deliberate strategies to maximise a positive club, club experience. And how do we bridge that? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, that's um that's a really good question as well because it's a reality for a lot of um I'm not going to say all because we don't know that but for a lot of um, sporting organisations and sporting codes I think the first thing um, is really to I guess start this conversation and so it's great that we've had that that, that question um, because it shows me that there is an appetite for knowledge um, and if you start from that point of evidence and if you start from that point of research informed solutions I think that goes a long way to being a really active tool of persuasion to challenge some of the dominant ideologies the, 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 the dominant decision making practices that we see in community sport and often in these uh, environments, it's very easy to do what we've always done. And, and that's one of the challenges that um, any parent, coach, administrator um, in these environments needs to be able to navigate. So I think research informed solutions are always a great starting point because it then defers from individual opinion uh, towards what might be considered best practice. We have another question here. Um, have you noticed a difference to these relationships um, when a team is winning versus not winning? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that that's a really good question because the inevitable outcome of competitive sport is win and loss, um, which I actually advocate for. So, um, which is a separate conversation. But I think to answer that question, uh, the competitive environment changes expectations. It influences our appraisal or our interpretation of experience. So you definitely see parents struggle to um, provide um, consistent emotional and informational support when it comes to helping children interpret their experiences because often parents are still working through their interpretation of you know it's not necessarily a win or a loss but the competitive experience before them so uh, you definitely see that play out and transpire in the way in which parents help children uh, interpret uh, their own individual performance um, thank you. So um, what are some additional things that maybe parents can do to positive impact their child's sports participation and development? 
Yeah, sure. So I mean, the first thing I'd say, Chantel, to reiterate from this presentation is adaption is really clear. We don't want parents to withdraw as children get older. We want them to stay involved, but they need to lean in and lean out of different emotional and social roles and responsibilities. Um, and so a lot of that is just regular communication with children because their priorities, their interests, their goals, their motives will change almost daily. And so this is a this is a really, I guess, um, interesting challenge for parents. But I would, I would use this analogy to, to help parents maybe think about how they can optimise their involvement. We never use the same pedagogical approach in teaching in year one with our children that we would use in year 12 because they naturally adapt. And so our educational approach needs to adapt as well. And if you use that kind of standpoint, it clearly undermines the idea that we don't need a one size fits all approach. We need an agile approach. And I think a lot of that is person first and um, parents can certainly adapt their involvement. The other thing that they could potentially do to, to optimize their involvement is to make sure that there is consistency with what they say and what they actually do. A lot of the research that I've actually seen over the last few years um, that, that really I find of interest is that a lot of children perceive parents to say one thing, but their nonverbal behavior during competition might say something else. And so it's really about trying to close the gap in terms of the meaning of sport and what we actually want for our children. Thanks, Sam. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, so do you see a role in policy um, and, and governing better behaviour in sports and actually making it more regulated, I guess? Yes, yeah, so this is a this is a challenging question because um, codes of behaviour is just one example are readily used in youth sport and yet we still see examples of um, conflictual relationships emerge, uh, especially as we sort of build to a, let's say, a culminating event like finals and best and fairest and so forth. So policies alone are, are not the answer. And what we've actually seen, and I've, I've actually published a, a couple of outputs on this, is looking at some other measures. And when you look at restrictive measures like fines and, and those kind of things, or even um, uh, restrictive Strict, sorry, contractual measures such as your codes of behaviour, your punitive measures such as banning players from uh, or parents from attending the games, um, they, they tend to be suboptimal for a range of reasons. And so where the current literature tells us that we, we get best bang for buck is to really work with parents as partners in this environment um, to actually develop educational resources that help them manage the emotional demands of competition, to build stronger relationships with coaches and to integrate themselves into this club environment. So I think ground up working with parents um, as partners rather than uh, the problem is really key. And, and it's not just the policies alone that will do that. It's, it's a range of other elements, but particularly educational resources and informational support. Thanks. We've we've just had another quick question. Um, doesn't have to be quick. We've got three minutes. So what about in country sport with a greater social base? At what stage do social complexities like bullying or, or something like that between peers go from a coach and or club responsibility to a parent responsibility? Yeah, I think that it, it, it's not time dependent. I think at any point there are instances of bullying, if there's instances of harassment and we could go maybe to a, a, a more um, uh, I guess a finer degree of examples like um, things that might be considered inappropriate forms of verbal behaviour from the sideline. I think at any level of, um, let's say, interaction, when it involves children involved in sport who might be sampling for the first time, who might be having a hard time away from sport, who may be building a sense of identity through their sport participation. It's actually a really important space for them to develop. As I said earlier, the positive youth development literature would suggest that there are five C's, the five, the five C's of sport participation that can be fostered through sport participation. So one of the, I, I guess, the piece of advice there is that it's everyone's responsibility. The behaviour you ignore is the behaviour you accept. And I think that's really important in youth sport because um, whether you're a volunteer, if you're running the water, if you're cutting the oranges, if you are a coach or a parent, if you can see see bullying, then you've got to have a conversation about that. The trick will be to disentangle yourself from the emotional involvement in that conversation. And I think that's where um, more research informed starting points uh, are going to hold everyone in, in, in I guess, a, a better light going forward. Thanks so much, Sam. That was really great. Um, we've had wonderful uh, and insightful discussion today. Um, and so thank you very much for sharing your time and knowledge with us. No um, I'd also like to thank our audience for all your questions and input and interest in this event. Remember, you can watch this session again on Flinders YouTube channel or Flinders University Meet the Minds webpage.
Uh, you can also sign up to receive um, notifications on all of our future events at the same site. Our next Meet the Minds lecture is on the topic of moving towards health, helping the most at-risk patients in hospital get moving. This lecture will be presented by Dr Claire Baldwin on Tuesday 21st of, Se 21st of September at 12.30pm and we hope you can join us. Thank you once again um, for today and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their week. Thank you. <laughs>